Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and good morning to all of you I wish you all a great day a great month and a great time every single minute in your lives Ameen uh, I hope and I pray that you and your family members all your loved ones are doing great in the best health and iman enjoying security peace comfort and peace of mind uh, this live broadcast again while traveling and wandering among the beautiful creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about some valuable information that we and everybody must know before witnessing Ramadan. As you know that this is an opportunity which only happens once a year. And subhanAllah, we've agreed before that every Ramadan should be better than the previous one. Every Ramadan should be better than the previous ones. And in order to make this Ramadan our best Ramadan ever, we really, really have to plan for it very well. Planning is both morally, spiritually, and physically. As you know that if somebody is visiting the gym for the first time and uh, decided to lift 200K, he was training his muscles, can injure himself or herself. And that's why we need warming up, stretching, uh, practicing before you be capable to lift 200k. Likewise, before Ramadan, you know, if they say tomorrow is Ramadan, mashallah, congratulations. Some people will say Ramadan Kareem, some people will say Ramadan Mubarak, then what? Are you ready? It becomes very problematic to many people because they were not mentally prepared for it. They were just told tomorrow is Ramadan, so we're going to fast like everyone else. But it's not gonna easy. It's not gonna be easy. Why? Because they are not mentally nor physically prepared. So the physical preparation is very crucial and important uh, as well. And as you know that it's only a couple of days left before Ramadan. So I was wondering whether you were able to pray a couple of rakahs last night, beginning to prepare for Tahajjud, because the Ramadan Taraweeh and Tahajjud is gonna be long. And for those who haven't been doing this since uh, last Ramadan, it might be a little tough. But anyway, we all seek the help of Allah. We ask Him to help and assist us and to make it easy. Meanwhile, I would like to show the magnificent creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while we're talking about it. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You feel like the clouds are touching uh, the ground were almost 700 meters above the sea level. Weather is very beautiful with sun, sunshine today, mashallah. I hope the weather will remain uh, same throughout the Ramadan, inshallah. All right. So as you know that the Prophet وسلم, stated in the hadith, deeds are but by their intentions. So every deed must be preceded with an intention. What we're gonna do, inshallah, in a couple of days where most likely, most likely, Ramadan is going to begin on uh, Tuesday. So if the first day of Ramadan is on Tuesday, then actually Ramadan begins Monday evening. Why am I saying that? Because many countries, the Masajid, are closed still. So they will not be able to pray in the Masjid. Go ahead and begin. Praying Taraweeh at home on Monday. If they announce Monday night, MashaAllah, tomorrow is going to be Ramadan. So the night precedes the day. And that means if they say tomorrow is Ramadan, then we're going to begin Taraweeh tonight, inshaAllah. The matter of intention. As you know that in the case of the mandatory fasting, whether Ramadan or fasting Abaw or making up Qaza and Mist, uh, fasting requires an intention before Fajr, unlike the voluntary fasting. Or before noon, and he would ask, is there any food to eat? So she would say, unfortunately, we don't have anything today. He said, it's okay, fasting today. 
and that indicates in the case of the voluntary fasting you can simply uh, intend fasting yes good morning to all of you by the way I will check out your questions and I will take them inshallah after I finish this uh, presentation okay I won't be able to answer questions in between in the case of the voluntary fasting uh, like what you, you all see the sunrise right now mashallah right look at this if I didn't eat anything and I decided to fast today, it's okay. But I didn't intend fasting before Fajr. But this is voluntary. And the case of Ramadan is entirely different. So I must formulate an intention before Fajr. And if I didn't, then the day doesn't count. Second question. How to formulate an intention? Third question, do I need to make an intention for each day of Ramadan, 29 or 30 days, or one intention for the whole month is sufficient? These are very valid and important questions, and I want you to share these questions and their answers with your children, your family members, because this is how to prepare for fasting. They wake up in the morning and they don't know. So you, you must inform them. That's why I said, uh, must know the information that I'm going to share with you before Ramadan, inshallah. So the intention for fasting is simply in the heart. I'm intending to fast tomorrow. And do I have to utter it? Do I have to pronounce it? And I say, I intend to fast because this is Ramadan? No. As a matter of fact, it is not even prescribed to pronounce the intention. As the Messenger of Allah has informed us, peace be upon him, that the intention is in the heart. And Allah knows what is alimun bidhat is sudur, what is in the heart. So you don't have to tell Allah. It is to formulate an intention, which is to confirm to yourself that you're fasting tomorrow, inshallah. And the intention must be formulated before dawn. And there is a difference of opinion whether it is sufficient to have an intention for the whole month or for each and every day. But in brief, it is sufficient to make an intention in the beginning of Ramadan, and that will be valid throughout the whole month of Ramadan. I'm planning to fast Ramadan this year, unless if I have a necessity or an emergency to skip fasting. So in this case, one intention is sufficient, inshallah, for the entire month. By the way, if you get up to eat the sahur meal by itself, that's an intention, all right? Because why would somebody get up at 2 or 3 a.m. to eat? During regular days, we don't do that. We only do that whenever we're planning to fast, correct? Okay. Our, I want to designate a great portion of my presentation right now to address your needs. As you know that, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, comforted Aisha, his wife, may Allah be pleased with her, when he saw her crying during Hajj because her menses started. And subhanAllah, every Muslim, whenever the menses start during Ramadan or during Hajj, they feel down and they feel sorry. They on all the doors of Adam. So you're not an exception. This is perfectly normal. Number two, Whenever a woman experiences her menses, even during the day of Ramadan, guess what? Even if it is only five minutes before sunset, in this case, unfortunately, that day doesn't count. So whether you eat or you don't, the day has to be made up because the menses nullify fasting and the prayers and also the tawaf all kind of tawaf which requires complete purity. Which means after Ramadan, inshallah, when you come to make up the next days, you include the day on which you experience the menses before sunset or before iftar time. Uh, Karen, about your daughter who's 15 years old um, and she's having epilepsy. All of us were praying for her. May Allah give her a quick 
a speedy and a complete recovery, indeed is able to do all things. And if she has to take the pill during the daytime, then she is eligible to skip fasting. And in this case, there is no cover for her. Simply feed one poor person for each day she doesn't fast. So let's say that I've got to take the pill three times a day, every eight hours. Then make no mistake about it. The seizures and epilepsy are serious. The person have to take them serious. And Allah said in the Quran, do not kill yourselves. Do not throw yourselves in harm ways. So go ahead and break your fast. You're not blameworthy. You're receiving a full reward as if you're fasting by simply feeding one poor person. And this answer is not only to Karen, but it's also to everyone who has a chronic disease. Somebody who's living with renal failure and doing renal dialysis. Don't push yourself to the edge. Don't fast. You need to drink a lot of water. Um, a breastfeeding woman who is weak, a pregnant woman who needs to take nutrition. You see the clause or the condition I mentioned? Not every pregnant woman, not every breastfeeding woman, she skips fasting. Only if they feel weak and day to day. I mean, we check it. look at those beautiful hills. Oh, subhanAllah, I cannot just skip that. I want to hear you all saying, subhanAllah, amazing, beautiful. And you see when the clouds are uh, covering some of the mountains, look at this colorful mountain that is approaching, mashallah. Okay, back to our subject, which is, what if any person is having a chronic disease where they live with it? They got to take medications hyper or hypotensive, diabetic, they got to take some sugar or a few bites every day, uh, every few hours. Don't push yourself to the edge. This is what Allah the Almighty said in the Quran. So what are you going to do? Skip fasting and feed one poor person. In the case of the pregnant women and the breastfeeding women, you skip fasting if you need to but you still make up the fasting whenever now you're capable because you don't breastfeed forever, right? And, you know, you're not going to be conceiving forever. So once you feel healthy, then you should make up the missed days of fasting, uh, which you miss during Ramadan for any of these valid reasons, inshallah. Um, in the case of the menses, Allah is the most merciful. He ordered the woman to make up the missed fasting, not the missed prayers. So if a woman had the menses for 10 days, she skips the prayers, the namaz, the five daily salawat. But she also skips fasting, but she doesn't have and she does not make up the missed prayers because there are too many, but she must make up the missed fasting, right? Okay. Our sisters in the kitchen, our sisters in the kitchen, they have to taste the food or otherwise my in-laws are coming. I want to make sure that the biryani is spicy enough. I want to make sure the nahari is uh, well done. So she tastes the food. Tasting the food is permissible and it doesn't violate fasting, but do not swallow it. You just taste it with the tip of your tongue. That is permissible only for those who are cooking, not for everyone. So your husband is walking into the kitchen and says, Honey, what are you doing for us today? Oh, mashallah, uh, let me take a bite, let me test it. No, that's not permissible. It's only for the chef or the cook in the kitchen to taste with the tip of the tongue, then to spit it out to make sure that the salt is okay, spices are okay and everything. Daughters, again, those who are asking about their daughters. You know, when does it become compulsory on our children to begin fasting? As you all know, in the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said, teach your children how to pray as early as the age of uh, seven and discipline them and order them to pray regularly at the age of 10, even though 
the prayer is not compulsory on any person until they reach the age of puberty. Likewise, fasting. You know what happens when your daughter was not fasting until she's now 14 and with the first menses? It becomes extremely difficult for her or for him to begin fasting all of a sudden. You know, when somebody accepts Islam and he's 50 or 60 and they say, hey, you got to fast for a whole day. Oh, no way. So likewise, and that's why they must be trained in advance. So even the six years old, they can fast till Zohr, till noon, till Asr, a few hours. We encourage them, we reward them, we buy them the sweet that they desire in order to encourage them to fast, inshallah. But whenever a person experiences any of the signs of puberty, Fasting becomes compulsory on them immediately. Likewise with the prayers, likewise with the hijab for girls, and so on. Why didn't you say the same about the zakah? I'll tell you. Because the zakah is compulsory in the wealth, not on the individual. I mean, if somebody died and he left a bunch of orphans, and he left a couple million bucks for them, these kids are orphans. Masakin, no, they're not masakin. They're orphans. It is true that they're orphans, but they're not masakin. So there is the zakah due in the wealth, not on them. So the wali or the guardian must take out zakah from the wealth of the orphans. And that's why Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, said to the guardian, استثمروا في أموال اليتامى لا تأكلها الزكاة. And if you are a guardian in a charge of the wealth of an orphan, you should make some investment in their wealth. Otherwise, keep paying, keep in paying zakah annually 2.5%. After a few years, uh, the wealth is gone. Why? Because it is sitting there. It's not doing anything. In the case of Hajj, likewise, reaching the age of puberty makes Hajj mandatory. So the exception is a zakah. It is due on one's wealth. The month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala labeled it and described in the Quran as the month of Quran, right? So each and every Muslim must have ahwal with the Quran during Ramadan. Completely different than our ahwal with the Quran before Ramadan. So if our respected sister Sariya MashaAllah, normally she makes Khatm al-Qur'an once a month. Then in Ramadan, she should do more. He will be expected to do it at least twice, maybe thrice. Why? Because the norms for her is to read one para every day. Now in Ramadan, I will dedicate more time for the Qur'an. A question in respect of what invalidates fasting. Does vomiting invalidate fasting? The answer is no, unless if it is induced. When somebody stuffs his finger in his throat to induce uh, vomiting, that invalidates fasting. Sometimes people who are seasick or uh, having some sort of nausea, they are nauseated, they need to vomit. That's an exception, but that invalidates fasting though. But under regular circumstances, if somebody happened to throw up naturally, that doesn't invalidate fasting. And it also doesn't invalidate the ablution uh, as well. Well, as you know that with the COVID, we have to take tests and uh, the lab work and so on. Does drawing blood or the lab test invalidate fasting during Ramadan? The answer is no, it doesn't, provided it is not a huge volume. Yani, for the lab test, it's okay. But donating blood, no, because we're talking about half liter, one liter of blood, and that definitely invalidates fasting. So you avoid doing that during the fasting time. Even the lab work, if you can postpone it and delay it, until you break your fast, fine. But if it is necessary, 
then bismillah, you're not blameworthy. I just remember one of my students in the USA uh, who used to attend my classes and she was epileptic to Sister Karen. And then she says, Sheikh, I know. I told her because whenever she has the fits, she's a different person. And, you know, it can affect herself and her family, her children, especially if she's driving. So I told her, you must not fast. Wallahi, brothers and sisters. You know what she used to do? She used to fast and she would take the pill still without water. And I keep telling her, why are you doing that to yourself? That doesn't count as fasting. You're not fasting. She says, I know, but I love to do it. I believe Allah the Almighty is the most generous. When the Almighty Allah sees this keenness from one of his servants, they're very keen to fast even though they are giving the concession not to fast. She's taking the medication without water. Why? Because she must take the medication. And meanwhile, she wants to live the mood of Ramadan. This is a mercy from Allah. On the other hand, I know some people who say, decades pass by and I never knew when would Ramadan begin and when would it end because they were not practicing Islam whatsoever. May Allah guide us to what is best. One of the great news I want to share with you that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Man sama, whoever happened to be fasting, فَخُتِمَ لَهُ بُصِيَامْ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Yani if, you, if somebody dies while fasting or even after baking his fast and the last uh, activity that he or she have done was fasting, they will enter paradise straight. Why? Because the khitam, the conclusion. And in the sound hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِينَ Deeds are by their conclusions. You see, every time I see a beautiful sight, I love to share with you, brothers and sisters. And what do we say? What do we say? We say, subhanAllah. By the way, I'm the one who's supposed to be uh, driving, but uh, my elder brother and one of my very best friends chose to be driving so that I can do this live broadcast. And I would like to introduce him. And he is none other than Had Mustafa Ahmed. I believe you all know him. Darus Salam for Hajj and Umrah for the past 30 years. Right, Hajj Mustafa, 30 years? 35. Allahu Akbar. 35 years. MashaAllah, naqata illa billah. Darus Salam is the world's biggest and the fanciest Hajj company all over the world. Alhamdulillah, shukullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let me take advantage of traveling because making dua while traveling is accepted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invite us again to his house. This time, Hadi Mustafa wouldn't be here. Normally, he spent the whole month of Ramadan in Mecca and Medina, mashallah. And um, to console him and all of you, because I know many of you and including myself, uh, would love to go for Umrah in Ramadan, but because of the COVID and the pandemic and the regulations, we're not able to. Guess what? Everyone who have made plans, even though we didn't travel, you've got the same reward. Alhamdulillah. You secure yourself the same reward. In the sound hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَنْ هَمَّ بِحَسَنَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا كَتَبَهَا اللَّهُ لَهُ حَسَنَةً كَامِلًا Whoever intended seriously to do a good deed, then he didn't get to do it. The Almighty Allah will record it for him as a fully good deed, even though he didn't do it. But wait a minute. This is amazing. This is amazing. Subhanallah. MashaAllah. هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ ذَلُولًا فَامْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِبِهَا وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ Subhanallah. You know this nice paved road carved in, uh, in between the mountains? We say it must be done by a good company, great engineers, hard workers. And some people look at the mountains around and they say, 
oh, they were created by chance, by accident. Wallahi, very foolish. Alhamdulillah, for guiding us to his straight path. Back to our plans about Hajj and Umrah and so on. Uh, you know, mashallah, every year, and correct me if I'm not uh, very accurate, Hajj Mustafa, the past few years, how many Hajj from the USA and Canada would join us? Approximately 3,000? About. 3,000 Hajjis from America. And you know the joy of serving the Hujjaj, it's unmatched. It's unlike anything else. Like if you say, would you like to go to Disney, Six Flags, or Niagara Falls, or whatever, or Hajj, or Umrah, right away, Umrah, or Hajj. So if you're not able to go, what is the alternative? Normally, in Umrah, you spend money. In Hajj, you spend money. True. What about if we dedicate this money which was allocated for the Umrah or Hajj to support those who have been affected big time because of the pandemic? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, a lot of people went out of business. And when the business owners go out of business, that means a lot of workers are laid off and staying at home jobless. They cannot provide for their family members. They cannot put bread on the table. And Ramadan is coming. So if in regular days you used to give a thousand, for God's sake, take my advice and make them two and three if you can afford it. Share the bite with others because I know for sure some people, wallahi, one day, you know, once uh, in, in the morning I showed you when I was buying a falafel sandwich after Fajr prayer. So I was at the restaurant waiting for my uh, food to be prepared and a very decent person approached me and he said, Salaamu Alaikum, Alaikum as -salam. He said, I'm the chef of such and such hotel, five-star hotel. He said, good to see you. I thought he's introducing himself. He said, you know, since the pandemic started, I lost my job and wallahi, wallahi, I'm starving. And I cannot find any money to buy food. Could you buy me a sandwich? Can you imagine? Wallahi, it broke my heart. So honorable people, he's a chef in a five-star hotel, but he lost his job. Especially those in tourism business or in Hajj and Umrah. So Wallahi, brothers and sisters, Allah the Almighty says in the Quran, there are certain people whom they're broke, they're in debt, they're troubled financially, but they never ask. Their condition is terrible, but they bear the hunger, the thirst, they don't ask. So Allah in the Quran is telling us to look for them. That person could be your brother, could be your cousin, your nephew, your neighbor. So he's a manager at some business or a principal at a school, but he's out of job and he is living hand to mouth. You've seen him, he has sold his car. Why? Because he wants to buy food for their family, pay for the rent and the utilities. From the zakah, you can support him. Some people are reluctant to pay zakah to certain people. They say, but he's a doctor. Yeah, but he's broke. He's a doctor, he's a principal. He was my teacher when I was in school, but university professors are among the most worthy people for zakat. They only have their salaries. They don't have any now. So look for them, check their conditions, inquire about them, and present them in the form of gift. A very important question. I'm going to answer it without your asking. Whenever you give any of these guys your zakat, do you have to tell them, hey, bro, this is zakah or this is sadaqah? No. And if you do, this is foolish. This is wrong. And niya, the intention is of the payer. I'm paying this as my zakah, alhamdulillah. You don't have to declare it to recipient because you need to respect their honor and their dignity. So... I'll give you some hints. Sometimes I visit that person. When the youngsters come, 
Masha Allah, how old are you? Eight years old. Oh, you know Surah Al-Fatiha? Yes, I know it. And I know Surah Amma, and I know Surah Al-Mulk. Okay, go ahead and recite. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and he recites a few verses. I say, Takbir, Masha Allah, beautiful. You deserve a big prize. Then the envelope is already prepared. This is a gift for you. You give it to whom? To the child. He has $500. $700, and the message is delivered. How did you learn that, Sheikh? I learned that from as in how, it doesn't know how to make wudu. So the grandsons of the Prophet وسلم, said to each other, we need to tell him, but how? So Al Hassan said to him, uncle, me and my brother, each one of us is claiming that he makes a better wudu. Can you judge us and see who is making a better ablution? He said, of course. He's happy now he's going to judge the grandsons of the Prophet So when Al-Hasan made wudu before him, he made wudu like his grandfather taught him, the Prophet Then al Hussein made the same exact wudu. So the older man recognized that they wanted to deliver the message to him. So he said, sons, both of you are right and I'm wrong message is delivered. You don't have to hurt any person's feeling. Your employee, I know many of you are business owners and taking some time to listen to me. Thank you so much. May Allah make you prosper. Now your employees are staying at home. Why? Because the business is suspended until a further notice. So I cannot pay them salaries because I'm not making any money. But you're paying your zakat, right? Yes. Those workers of you, the employees, are more worthy than anybody else. How come, Sheikh? They work for me. They're not working for you anymore. You're not paying them. And you know the financial condition. So you take the initiative, provided you don't make them under the impression that you're giving them a salary. Or you got to compensate me when you come back or do some work for me. Because as zakah is a means of purifying your wealth not a means of receiving compensation. I remember once I've made a live broadcast where I have mentioned something you have heard for the first time. Most of us, when we give sadaqah to the poor person who say, pray for me a hajj, I said, don't do that. Because when you ask somebody to pray for you and you give him money, you got paid. You got compensated. You wanted him to do you a favor, don't ask. Just give him the sadaqah and don't ask him to pray for you. But what is wrong with that? He's going to pray for you anyway. Imagine somebody is giving me brand new pair of shoes or a perfume or a coffee or a sandwich. Am I not going to pray for him? Wallahi, I'm going to pray for him and a lot. One day I was traveling for Umrah. And uh, there was one paper missing at the airport. It's not really a big deal, but the officer at the passport control insisted. He said he had to get this paper. I'm coming from the USA. I'm on a transit airport. If I miss the flight, my umrah is blown away. It's messed up. So he insisted. I said, may I speak to your superior? He looked at me. With a sarcastic look, he said, really? Oh, yeah, go to the office. So I went and I saw a colonel sitting in the office. And I said, sir, uh, here is my condition. And I'm going for Umrah and I don't have that paper. But all my paperwork is, my visa and everything is uh, clear. He looked at me and he said, son, if I sign for you to travel, my own responsibility, would you make dua for me? I said, of course. No questions asked. This incident happened more than 20 years ago. I don't even recall the name of the uh, colonel. And every time I remember him, whenever I go for Hajj or Umrah, more than 20 years, I pray for him. And guess what? Right now, whether he's alive or dead, may Allah have mercy on him. May Allah admit him to paradise. Why? Because he assisted me. In the hadith, the Prophet said, whoever does you a favor, you should compensate them. You should pay them back. 
well, I can't afford it. He said, if you cannot afford it, then pray for them. It is sufficient. So I, as a payer of sadaqah or zakah, I shouldn't ask for it. Why? It's in the Quran, really. Yes, in Surah Al-Insan, Allah Almighty says, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجِهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطعام. So they give whatever they give for the sake of Allah. They are not waiting or anticipating any thanks or any gratitude or even thank you. So when you give somebody a gift or money and he doesn't say thank you, so what? I was not actually meaning that person. I meant Allah. I put my sadaqah in Allah's hand. So even if this person is rude to me, who cares? I'm doing this, the wajhillah, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know I've taken much of your time, brothers and sisters, and uh, to be continued, inshallah. Let's all pray that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove this calamity so we can resume hajj and umrah and i'tikaf in the haram and go in Ramadan and throughout the year. Let's pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up all the businesses back and the airports so that we have learned the lesson. We appreciate the countless blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of living a normal life. And pray for all the dead ones, those who passed away. May Allah have mercy on them. And not to forget to pray that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to witness a blessed month of Ramadan as follows. Allahumma balighna Ramadan ghayra faqideena wa la mafqoodeen. Allahumma sallim ilayna Ramadan kamilan wa tasallamhu minna mutaqabbalan. اللهم سلمنا إلى رمضان وتسلمه منا متقبلا يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم إنا نسألك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك والسلامة من كل إثم والغنيمة من كل بر ونسألك اللهم الفوز بالجنة والنجاة من النار يا عزيز يا غفار اللهم هيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا واجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اشف مرضانا وارحم موتانا واهلك أعداءنا واختم بالباقيات الصالحات أعمالنا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من البرص والجنون والجذام ومن سيء الأسقام اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من زوال نعمتك وتحول عافيتك وفجاءة نقمتك وجميع سخطك اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين uh, Brothers and sisters go ahead and send as many questions as you want إن شاء الله on the way I'm going to collect them, then maybe either tonight or tomorrow I will have a live broadcast to answer your valuable questions. I would appreciate if you focus more on Ramadan and fasting. Pray for me. I pray for you. Love you all for the sake of Allah. Don't forget to share with us where you're watching from. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.